for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the book of Galatians and kind of just going through uh, that book in a series of lessons. And this morning, we are in Galatians chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 13. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 13 and going through the end of the chapter. And uh, really just kind of... uh, what we're going to do in this lesson is we're going to kind of take a, a big picture view of the, the flow of thought in one chunk of text and then go back over it and kind of break down the pieces here. We want to keep in mind, of course, the overall context of Galatians and what's going on. There's these Judaizing teachers that were going around and they were saying that uh, you had to become a Jew before you could become a Christian. You had to be circumcised and obey the law of Moses before you could really think about this relationship with Christ. And of course, Paul, he sees that as completely absurd and wrong uh, and even gets downright insulting in chapter 5. Last week we talked about how, you know, I wish that those people who were telling you to cut yourselves would go cut themselves and uh, cut, their, uh, well, cut on their own flesh, essentially. They're cutting you off from the truth. But now, in chapter 5, verse 13, Paul begins to shift his attention to talking about what fulfillment of the law really means. You know, we think of the law as something that doesn't have a role or just something to be discarded. But Paul says, no, you actually want to fulfill the law. You just don't fulfill it the way the Judaizers are saying. You don't fulfill the law by conforming to some physical requirement like circumcision. You conform to the law by loving one's neighbor as oneself. When Jesus was asked, what are the most important commandments in the law? He said, it was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And that the second commandment was like it. You are to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the result of that, of course, is um, you know, that the two ideas of loving God and loving one's neighbor are so intertwined in Scripture that when Paul quotes uh, the fulfillment of the law, he doesn't even bother mentioning loving God. He takes that as a given. Instead, he says the law is summed up in this bit. You love your neighbor as yourself. And religious people, they don't have a hard time confessing to the abstract idea of loving God. But loving one's neighbor, practically demonstrating love in relations with other people, well, that's hard because people don't tend to be as lovable as God is a lot of the time. And so that, that creates all kinds of difficulties. But I want to look at this, this outline, if you will, And even though I said the lesson was going through verse 26, the outline is all the way through 6.5 because I like to mess with numbers and confuse people. So uh, this is the overall outline. It's going to be a huge block of text, just to warn you, but uh, it looks like that. And you just think for a minute, uh, why, why... Now, normally when I see structures like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, F, E, C, D, C, V, A, I'm a little skeptical, and you might be a little skeptical too, but... Let's go through it, and you can judge for yourselves uh, if this is, in fact, what Paul had in mind. The idea here, and I'm just going to read the text uh, at this point, starting in verse 13, and you can judge for yourselves if this fits. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in this statement, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, 
Let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Brethren, if in, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be t- to be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. Now, what will we do? When did that go out? Did that go out while I was reading? Forget the PowerPoint. You know what? This is uh, we're going to do this old school today. Uh, all right. So we're going to pick up in chapter five and verse thirteen. You know this idea that we don't turn our freedom into the opportunity for the flesh. Earlier in chapter five and verse one, Paul said it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Freedom is important to Paul in this letter. Uh, being subject to the law means being enslaved, but being uh, being freed from the law means that you don't subject yourselves to the law. You don't conform yourself to the requirements of the flesh. And you also don't use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. See, I, our freedom, our call to freedom, means that we don't use our freedom as an opportunity to advance the flesh. Now, there are two ways you can do that. You can advance the flesh by, you know, going like the Judaizers did and preaching that we should conform ourselves to some kind of fleshly requirement in order to be saved. Or uh, you could use your opportunity as a flesh to just indulge yourself, indulge your carnal desires. You know, grab all the gusto you can get. And Paul talks about that as well. You know, our freedom, when when Paul's talking about this idea of freedom, uh, you know, just because we're freed from the law, that doesn't make us free to do anything we want. It doesn't make us free to just satisfy whatever desires we want. Uh, if you read 1 Corinthians, the whole problem the Corinthians were having was they took this very warped view of freedom in Christ. They had a very perverse understanding of what that was. And they said, oh, well, you know, I'm in Christ. I'm free so I can go do whatever I want and go live lawlessly and have license to sin. And that's not what freedom means. That's not what freedom in Christ means. It's not an opportunity for the flesh. Paul might have been accused of advocating lawlessness and handing out license to sin with what he says, Hey, it's back! Yay! I, I, don't, I don't know why it does this. I... Alright, so what I was going to do is this. All right, so we're on this part, fulfilling the law with love. Paul might have gone around and you know, he said that the Judaizers had it wrong and that you shouldn't conform to the law of Moses to be saved. And the Judaizers might have said, well, look at Paul. He's just, you know, this big grace-only thinker who thinks that anybody, people can just do whatever they want. There's no rules. Everybody's free to do what they want. And Paul says, that's not at all what I mean. You know, it's, it's just interesting. Paul doesn't talk about God's grace without coming back around to explain the, the right living that grace demands. Grace... You know, I mean, your grace is uh, it's free gift of God, yes. But God expects something of you in return, nonetheless. He's given this to you. But you know, in the ancient world, when people demonstrated grace to each other, they expected you to do something for them in return. And God expects something of us. He expects us to live a certain way. We can't get around that. We don't live according to the flesh. We live according to the Spirit. Now what does he mean by that? Flesh talking about the, the skin organ on our body. Uh, you know, some people interpret flesh to mean sinful nature, uh, and some versions actually translate it that way. Uh, you know, you can make a case for that. That's not what flesh means everywhere it appears. Um, you know, there are places in Scripture that talk about the spirit of error or the spirit of harlotry or the in one first John the spirit of the antichrist there's kind of this anti spirit you know just as there's Christ and there's antichrist there's spirit and then there's kind of an anti spirit if you will a bad spirit and Paul he doesn't say that he says flesh but he basically means the same thing by that this this opposition if you will to the spirit of god And when Paul talks about flesh and spirit, he's talking about two mutually exclusive modes of living. Uh, You can find a similar contrast in the book of Romans, Romans 7 and 8. 
the flesh and the spirit, they're, they're sometimes contrasted in Scripture, but they're not always opposites. You think of Ezekiel, where the prophet talks about God pouring out His Spirit and uh, taking the heart of stone out of somebody and putting in a heart of flesh. We even sang a song about that this morning. You know, uh, the, God's grace can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. That's what the Spirit of God does. Melts the heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. No, the flesh is that which is weak. It's the human method. It's the human solution. By itself, the flesh can accomplish nothing in terms of right standing before God. It's focused on serving self. It's focused on meeting carnal desires. But the spirit, the spirit has a different goal. It has a different method in mind. It's focused on serving others, meeting spiritual goals. The flesh is focused on the physical requirement, circumcision. But the Spirit is focused on the spiritual requirement of a transformed heart. It is not the Jew. The true Jew is not the one who is circumcised outwardly, but one whose circumcision is of the heart. His favor is not towards men, but towards God. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now, when Paul talks about the law, you want to fulfill the law. You don't fulfill the law by requirement of the flesh. You fulfill the law with love. And that's where we come back to this relevance of the point that's actually on the PowerPoint. Just because we are... It's, it's very similar to what Paul says elsewhere in Romans 13. It's a quote from the law of Moses itself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Paul wasn't going around saying, you know, we just need to throw the law in the trash. Just take, rip the Old Testaments out of your Bible and throw that away. Well, you wonder why... Well, you know, people that interpret him that way, certainly. But one wonders why Paul quotes it so much if he thinks it's just completely something to be discarded. No, it's there for our learning. It's there for our instruction. And it's there to teach us what really does please God. And in this case, the point is not to get rid of the law of Moses. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill And the point for us is to also fulfill the law by living according to this edict that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Christ, we fulfill the law in a way that we never could when the old covenant was in force. When we truly live in Christ, we live in imitation of Christ, we live conformed to a crucified Christ, then we wind up doing everything that the law of Moses demanded in the first place. Christianity is the thing that transcends and encompasses the law. Not in the sense of you know, fulfilling each of the individual commandments, mind you, but in the sense of fulfilling the main demand of the law, which is that we love the Lord and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what fulfillment of the law means. It doesn't mean that you, know, you never eat pork or that you, uh, you, know, you always wear tassels on your clothes. It means loving one's neighbor as oneself and loving the Lord and understanding the significance, understanding which parts of the model were not to scale and understanding which parts God was truly interested in. Understanding that we interpret not by the letter but by the Spirit of God. And when we truly live in Christ, then we fulfill the law of Moses. You know, well, I said law of Moses, but what law is he talking about here? You know, Some people want to jump in and say, you know, it's the law of Moses. It makes sense in this context because it's what he's been talking about all along. Is it the law of Christ? Which is a thing. He mentions it in Galatians 6. You know, what is the law of Christ? You know, I mean, one searches the New Testament in vain for any actual legal genre material. Uh, it's not there. The only thing we have is, well, Christ and the way he lived his life and the implications of his death and his burial and his resurrection. Um, you know, and Christ is the living embodiment of the law. The law was words on a page, but Christ, the Word who became flesh, well, He was the one that the law was really talking about the whole time. Does He say in John chapter 5, you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have life, but it is these that speak of Me. That's, you know, law is fulfilled with loving one's neighbor as oneself. But what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? You know, we'll have more to say about that you know, in next week when we get to Galatians 6. But you know, I just want to note this in passing. You know, some, I think the mistake that gets taught sometimes you know, is, oh, loving your neighbor as yourself. Well, you need to learn to love yourself first. That's not the problem. People, human beings don't usually have a problem loving themselves. They're usually pretty good at that part. Um, 
I, I mean, you know, once in a while you'll find some exception, you know, psychological issue or whatnot. But most of the time, human beings don't have a problem loving themselves. You know, that's not. That's why there's no commandment in the Bible to love yourself because God doesn't usually tell people to do stuff they're already doing. It's the part that you seem to have trouble with. The Lord says is taking that love and applying it to other people, and actually, yeah, you know, I mean. Because, you know, you're willing to extend yourself a certain amount of forbearance. You're willing to give yourself the benefit of the doubt almost all the time. But when it comes to other people, well, not so willing to forgive. Not so willing to give benefit of the doubt. Always holding them to a higher standard or a stricter standard. And the Lord says it not ought to be that way. You love your neighbor as yourself. The whole point of the Sermon on the Mount, by the way, is just this big exposition on what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, that whole exposition about, you know... Don't judge, because whatever standard you use will be applied to you. The point is, stop using one standard for yourself and another standard for other people. Otherwise, you don't love your neighbor as yourself. You know? I mean, it's, it's, it's all sorts of other things, you know? If I get angry with a clerk in a drive through it's because I'm having a bad day, but I'm normally a good person on the inside. But if they get angry at me, well, they're just a bad person. You see the double standard? You know, it's the kind of things that people will reason with and put through, and that's not appropriate. You know, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't bite and devour one another. <laughs> Was this a problem? Cannibalism in church? I mean, well, what's going on here? That's the opposite of loving one's neighbor. The, the false teachers, they were actually engaging in this behavior by trying to bite and devour Paul. Um, you know, we have to teach children not to bite each other. But, you know, Paul has to say this to oh, grown adults who are supposed to, should know better. Don't bite one another. And if you do bite one another, take care that you don't consume one another. And here's the great irony. The false teachers, in their great zeal for the law, are actually violating the law by not loving one's neighbor as oneself. What does their character say about their message? That's the question you have to ask here. It becomes obvious. You, you want to know if somebody really practices what they preach. You know, you look at their character. Uh, it becomes obvious who has the Spirit of God and who doesn't. It becomes obvious when you look at Paul and when you look at the Judaizers, hmm, which one of them is actually living according to the law? Which one of them is actually following the Spirit of God? Which one of them actually is acting like Jesus? The one who says, hey, let's love our neighbors ourselves? Or the one that says, you can't be in our secret club unless you conform to the right of circumcision. Hmm. Hmm. It becomes who obvious who has the law in their hearts and who's paying lip service. What makes it obvious, though? What makes it obvious when a person is doing the right thing and what person is it obvious when a person is doing the right thing and when a person is doing the wrong thing? It actually is. Just look at what someone does. Look at their fruits. Look at their actions. Look at the way somebody walks. You know, Paul attacks the doctrine of the false teachers quite a bit in this letter. But you know what the main thing he goes after the false teachers for here is? Their character. Their false teaching is false teaching because it is false living. Because their conduct is completely out of step with what God would have. You know, I, I mean, you could, be, you could say literally every single thing right from the pulpit and still be a false teacher. Because of the way you live. Because of the way you act. If you don't live according to this principle, love your neighbor as yourself, then the Christ you proclaim is a Christ proclaimed falsely. <laughs> and so Paul gets into these contrasts. Walk by the Spirit. And if you walk by the Spirit, you won't carry out the desires of the flesh. Then later, be led by the Spirit. No, the flesh, you know, the flesh was... a. Well, the law and the flesh are intertwined a lot in this discussion. Even though you're supposed to be fulfilling the law, the law also has a certain threat to freedom that it carries because it enslaves one to the flesh. The flesh is just this taskmaster. It has appetites and demands that control us. The spirit, though, not a taskmaster, but a teacher, guides us, leads us. The law puts a gun to your head and says, do this or die. The spirit transforms us from within and actually makes us want to do the thing, the right thing that we should have done in the first place. It's like Jeremiah said, they will no longer teach each man his brother and each man his neighbor saying, know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. God said, I'm going to write my law on their hearts and on their minds. 
I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. The law is written on the heart by the Spirit of God. The flesh and the Spirit, Paul says, are in opposition to one another. Those are two modes of living. They're inherently incompatible. And we must choose which one we want to live by. Whether we want to serve two... Well, we can't serve two masters. You've got to pick one. And if you're serving the flesh, you're not serving the Spirit. In a sense, Paul describes the body as turned into a battleground here. A place of opposition between one another. A place where you no longer do the things that you please. What does he say here? You know, you are, the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, but these are in opposition to one another, so you may not do the things that you please. Romans 7 does something similar. It describes this, you know, Paul's like, well, I want to do this, but if I do the thing, I, he says, I don't want to sin, but I do it anyway. I'm doing the thing I don't want to do, and it's not I doing it, it's sin that dwells in me. It's a very confusing tongue twister. I can't quote it correctly without reading it in Romans 7, but... That's what, what's going on. The law creates a man who is torn between what he knows is right and what his flesh wants to do. Anybody ever felt that way? I mean, I feel that way all the time. Torn between what I know is right and what, I, you know, what my carnal desires really want to do. As Christians, we're torn between two realms. We live in the heavenly places with Christ and we want to be with Him and we want to be with Him above and we have eternal life and light and ruled by the gospel and faith. But we also live in the world. That's a place that's defined by the flesh. It's of this. It's below, temporal, full of death, darkness, ruled by the law and works. The law isn't how one gets the spirit. The spirit is not in the realm of the law. Verse eighteen. And the one who has the spirit. He isn't under the law. Paul already kind of said this earlier in chapter 3. He asked, he said, I want to, I want to find out this from you. Verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Where did it come from? Did it come? Did, did you get the Holy Spirit because you kept a bunch of commandments in the law of Moses? Or did you get the Spirit because you heard the message of the gospel and responded with faith and were immersed with the forgiveness of sins? Which was it? Which one? You get the Spirit by response to the gospel, by hearing with faith. You don't get the Spirit by engaging in these works of the law, and engaging in circumcision, things like that. You don't get the Spirit because you didn't eat bacon and shellfish. Now, okay, now this is all well and good, you know, these different realms that we can live in, but which realm am I living in? How can I tell which realm I'm living in? Well, first, let's talk about deeds of the flesh. And then let's talk about fruits of the Spirit, and you tell me which one, which, which one goes where. Look at your deeds. Look at your life. Look at your fruit. And if you're more in category one than category two, you might be living in the realm of the flesh. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality. Uh, the New Reconciliation Standard says immorality, which is a really ambiguous word for a term in Greek, which is really explicitly referring to sexual immorality. So, you know, deeds of the flesh are fornication, Impurity, which is basically like a, a less extreme than fornication, but still sexual in nature. And sensuality, which is even less extreme, but still sexual in nature. You know, why does he use all these different words for, you know, one's sexual promiscuity, one might ask. So, you know, it, it raises a question, of course. People sometimes ask, you know, who are in these relationships, one of them, well, how far can I go before it's considered wrong? Or how far can I go before it's considered unchastity? Or whatever. That's the wrong question. It's an absurd question. You know, you can't go anywhere with her unless you're married to her. You can't do those types of things. You can't engage in that type of activity and not be in conformity with what God says. I said that weird and wrong, I'm sure. You can't engage in sexually immoral behavior and it not and it be somebody you're not married to. It's just that simple. You know, it... And I mean, you see this all the time. You know, people people want to engage in, the, in this uh, recreational type foreplay with one another. You know, well, I'm not married, so nobody's getting hurt or whatnot. But see, here's the thing. You know, it's it's a double standard. 
Because there are things that I am not allowed. I, I, there are things that I am not allowed to do with any woman because I'm a married man and my wife, and it would be considered cheating if I were doing them. You know, even if it was something as innocent as kissing. But for some reason, we think, oh well, you know, you know, unmarried people can somehow engage in these activities and it not and just be okay. I'm scratching my head over that one a little bit, just a little bit. Now, that's that's something I, I you know. Look at the scriptures, and we have to think about that and think about those types of things. But where are we? What realm are we in when we're engaging that kind of behavior? Are we in the realm of the spirit or are we in the realm of the flesh? You tell me. Also, he mentions idolatry, sorcery, enmities. Idolatry and sorcery are on the same level as enmities. What is enmities? Enmities is when you make enemies out of people. Imagine that. You know, some people are very good at making enemies. Some Christians are very good at making enemies. They're just constantly getting into fights with everybody. You know, but that's not the right that's not the way of Christ, constantly creating contention. You know, it's one thing to contend for the faith. It's another thing to contend for every personal pet peeve that a person has. Not gonna work. That's enmities. And in connection with that, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. There you go. Well, I'm not normally an angry person. I just had that one moment of weakness. Outburst of anger. That one moment of weakness is on the list of deeds of the flesh. Think about that. That's kind of scary. For someone like me, especially, who, you know, I could probably, I could probably gets angry at all sorts of weird stuff. Disputes. Dissensions. Factions. You know, is the body of Christ supposed to be at war with itself? Is a local congregation supposed to be constantly having these different, you know, well, my team versus your team and constant disagreements and arguments and fussing over things that don't make a bit of difference in the realm of eternity? No. Well, I couldn't find it on that list, so I guess my sin's okay. Right? Well, no. It doesn't work that way. Because what does, he, what does he end the list with? Things like these. This isn't an all-inclusive list. This list of deeds of the flesh, this isn't the exhaustive list of things you can never do. This is a sampling, if you will. Things like these. Look at your actions. Do my actions belong on this list? Do my actions fit in the category of things like these? Paul says, you know, that, that things like these. Anything on this list and things like these can keep you out of heaven. Uh, he also mentions envying drunkenness and carousing and things like these. I forewarned you. I have forewarned you. I'm going to keep warning you about it. You practice that, you're not inheriting the kingdom of God. That should give us reason to fear. The world, the world wants to say, well, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's okay. You know, the world pushes and espouses quite a different sexual ethic than we find in the Bible, because to the world, the only thing that matters is consent. Holiness isn't even a consideration. It isn't even a factor. I mean, because who was God to tell people what to do in the bedroom? You know, besides the inventor of sex itself. Whoa. And then, again, it's debatable whether anything on this list truly avoids hurting others. You're always hurting someone when you engage in deeds in the flesh. You're not loving your neighbor as yourself. And you're not loving the Lord who told you what to do. You contrast that with the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And you notice a couple things. Number one, the first list was a bunch of things you do, works that you do. They're more like, but the fruits of the Spirit are more like qualities we possess. You know, fornication, that's a specific act that you engage in. But love? Love's not an act. Love's a quality you possess. And it defines all of your acts, or it really ought to. And that's the difference here. Is, you know, we, we want to find the checklist. Here's the seven things you need to do to be a good person. Here's the five things you need to do to go to heaven. We want to simplify it and make it a checklist. And I'm telling you right now, your relationship with God does not work that way. You're required to love the Lord with all your heart and soul. And that's not a checklist. That can't be summed up in a checklist. That's something that should define your existence. It defines who you are and what you're going to do for the rest of your life and how you're going to live. It permeates every aspect of your existence. You can't compartmentalize yourself from it. There's no escaping it. 
loving the Lord with all your heart? That's that's not a checklist. Checklists are easy. That's not easy. It's a challenge to each and every one of us to conform to a different way of living. And you look at this list of qualities here. Love. Love is the thing Paul said was the fulfillment of the law. Back in point A. Joy. How many of us have joy? Are we constantly sulking? Constantly complaining? Constantly you know, looking around with scowls and frowns on our faces? Or do we see Christianity as a religion of joy? Something that, you know, permeates our existence. Are we miserable all the time? Are we complaining all the time? Are we fussing all the time? And I mean, I'll tell you, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the master of complaining. So, I, I, you know, I, I understand how that works. But where's the joy? Could I use more joy in my life? Peace. Are you the sort of person that wants to start fights with each other? Constantly wants to start fights with people? Peace does not start fights with others for no reason. Patience. Not prone to impulsiveness or pushiness or constantly, you know, it's got to be getting my way right now. No, you need to pray for the Lord to give you patience and not pray that He give it to you right now. Actually, that's a pretty scary prayer to pray. Pray for patience. The Lord has answered that prayer a lot. It just kind of makes you nervous to pray for it again. It does. Patience is a hard quality to build. But it's a fruit of the Spirit. Kindness. Just don't be mean to other people. I mean, you know, that's it's, it's not kind to insult others or berate others. Don't be mean to people. Be kind. Goodness. As opposed to badness. You know, some people really revel in badness. And they, they'll never admit that, but they do. You know, Faithfulness? Faithfulness is like trustworthiness. It's not... Faithfulness doesn't mean full of faith. It means that you're trustworthy is what it means. Uh, it's to be the sort of person that you know other people can trust. I can trust you with my car keys. I can trust you with my kids. I can you know, be the sort of person that's dependable. And you know, I, you're not the sort of person that, well, I wonder if he's going to show up today. I wonder if you're going to show up to help. Is that trustworthiness? Is that faithfulness? If people are constantly having to wonder about you, constantly having to wonder if you're going to be there for them, if you're going to be there to help out, if you're going to be there to you know, uh, work with them, that's not faithfulness. It's not a f- gentleness. You know, some people are very prickly, rough around the edges, constantly exploding at every little thing that happens to them. But gentleness, you know, you know, gentleness looks for some uh, you know a calmer demeanor, more peaceful demeanor. And it doesn't mean that there's never a time for anger or righteous anger. The Lord gets angry, certainly. But do you think the Lord is gentle? I mean, the Lord is the awesome creator of the whole universe who can destroy everything in the blink of an eye. And yet, we, who have sinned against Him so many times, are still here. Do you think the Lord is patient with us? Do you think He's gentle with us? (laughs) He'd have to be, or none of us would be here. Self-control. Self-control, that's the opposite of pursuing fleshly appetites. The opposite of just constantly chasing all the things that our flesh desires. Now, we could say a lot about the fruits of the Spirit. It really kind of deserves its own lesson, multiple lessons. Now, it has its roots in Old Testament prophecy, actually. You know, whenever the Old Testament talked about God pouring out His Spirit, He talks about like the land becoming a fertile field and producing fruits. Uh, there's a lot... Joel chapter 2, even. You know, the passage... Right, You know, Joel chapter 2, which is quoted in the Acts 2, God pours out His Spirit and everybody prophesies. But the passage immediately before that is talking about what? The restoration of their fields and their fruits and all the things that were happening. You know, making up for the locust plague that had just hit them. Isaiah 61.11, God causes righteousness and praise to spring up like a sown garden. Jeremiah 17, Psalm 1, the one who... Uh, the one who trusts in God, the one who walks in the counsel of the righteous, that one will be like a tree firmly planted that gives its fruit in its season. You have the Spirit of God, you'll produce fruit. And there's no law against these fruits. Nobody ever made a law outlawing love or kindness or gentleness. I think you'd have to be out of your mind to outlaw things like that. Rather, what is it? Love, kindness, gentleness, those are not outside. Those are way, 
Those aren't against the law. Those are how you fulfill the law. And the one who has the Spirit of God winds up being a better law keeper than the one who just relies on the law. About that. What's the key to all this? Christ. If you belong to Christ, you crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. It's like how... And, you know, you can't separate being crucified with Christ from having the Spirit of God. They go together. They're hand in hand with one another. You know, Paul was crucified with Christ. He no longer lived. His life... He lived a life in the flesh, but it was a life that was really lived by faith in the Son of God who loved Him and gave Himself up for Him. Galatians 2.20 Paul said, I am crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. And the choice is ours, which realm we will live in, whether we will be crucified with Christ, or whether we will live by the flesh. And the result, of course, we must walk by the Spirit, because if you're going to live by the Spirit, it's kind of like, it's kind of redundant to say that. If you're going to live by the Spirit, then live by the Spirit. Because walking is just a way of talking about living. Uh, If you're going to do it, then do it. Since the Spirit gave you life, you should live a life that fits that. And if you're going to live by the Spirit, then you shouldn't be doing fleshly things. Don't be conceited against one another. Don't be boastful. Don't challenge one another. Don't envy one another. Don't be cruel or unkind or braggadocious. That's pretty straightforward. Instead, what should we do? We should fulfill the law with service. We should restore those who are caught up in trespasses. We should bear one another's burdens. We should not think too much of ourselves. We should examine our own work. We should bear our own load. Well, that brings us to the question, which we will talk about next time. You know, this is this a contradiction? You know, uh, on the one hand, verse two says, of chapter six says, "Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ." But then in verse five, it says, "Each one will bear his own load." What does we do with that? How do we reconcile that? Well, we're going to talk about that next week. And we'll explore in more detail what it means to bear one another's burdens and yet to bear our own burden. But that's this part of Galatians in a nutshell. And to see the big picture view, you have a choice. The question you have to answer, am I going to make the right choice? Am I crucified with Christ or am I going to continue living by the flesh? Am I walking by the Spirit or am I going to continue walking by the flesh? Do I live my life according to the fruits of the Spirit or do I commit deeds of the flesh? If you're here this morning, your relationship with God is not what it needs to be. You need to be crucified. Perhaps you need to be crucified with Christ for the first time by being buried with Him in baptism. Or perhaps you need to be restored to Christ because you've not been walking by the Spirit. Now is a time and a place where you can make that known, where you can make your life right with the Lord. And we would be happy to encourage you in that path and bring you into conformity to His will. Won't you do that while together we stand and we sing, song selected.